Okay, so let's go ahead and move on. And my first meme, this isn't a funny one. This is a serious one, okay? I, want, I didn't know Keller was, if I had it prepared, I'd have a funny one for him. But <laughs> um, Justified freely by his grace. As you know, this is one of my favorite verses. It's up here on the wall at Tippecanoe Park. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. If people would only take these verses for what they say, they would really have a clear understanding of the gospel. Um, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. What does that verse mean? Well, justified means to be pronounced righteous. God pronounces you as righteous when you trust him as his Savior. It's more than pardon or forgiveness, and it's, your sins are gone. It's not necessarily that you're being progressively made better. He looks at you as already justified. Your sins have been paid for. So the second you trust Christ as Savior, that verse there, being justified freely by his grace. Now, what does freely mean? That actual word freely, it means without a cause, what that word actually means. Now, here's the thing. People accuse me sometimes of cheap grace. I don't, I don't teach cheap grace. I'm worse than that. I teach free grace. Okay, I believe it's free. And actually, free and grace is kind of like put them together. They both mean the same thing, the way I look at it. So I believe grace is free. So when it says there, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption, and we know what redemption means. Redemption means we're in that uh, cesspool of sin, and Jesus comes in, and he pays, for our, pays us to get out of there. That's what redemption means. You're redeemed. He bought you out of there. Um, you could not, you're in debt. You cannot pay that debt. He paid that debt for you. So that's what redemption means. It means you're set free. He paid the total price for your sins. And then the last word on there, grace. Everybody knows what grace means, right? Everybody supposedly knows, but they don't follow it. They don't believe it. Um, grace means unmerited, undeserved favor of God, right? You don't deserve it. He, he, you, you don't merit it. You don't do anything to earn grace. Grace means grace. So that whole verse, if you look at the, what justified means, you look at what freely means, you look at grace means, you look at redemption means, it's all in Christ Jesus. So that really is a, a wonderful verse if people would just take it for what it says. Same with Ephesians 2, 8, 9 and John 6, 3, 16 and many other verses. But they kind of gloss over them and it seems like sometimes they'll pick the verses that are more complex and try to build their doctrine around that. And that's a bad habit to get into. So... I, I love that verse. I think that's a very good verse, Romans 3.24. So that was my meme for today. And to go along with that, um, my friend Dan Lash, he's got a church up in Weston Street Baptist Church in Rome, Indiana. Who all knows where Rome, Indiana is? Okay, who knows where Mexico, Indiana is? Who knows? Okay, y'all know where Mexico What's the other city called right near Mexico? It's a foreign. Russia feels right down the road. Well, the Russia feels down the road. But, okay, but Rome, Indiana... Peru, that's what I'm thinking of, yeah. So, but Rome is north of there, and so when in Rome, be like the Romans, right? Yeah. But my friend Dan Lash has a church up there, and I put his website up there in the corner, Weston B, uh, S, westonsbc.com, Weston Street Baptist Church in Rome, Indiana. And he's wrote a bunch of these little pamphlets and books, which are excellent. He's, he's excellent writing these little books, explaining different things of doctrines. But he has this one of the axioms of assurance, so I just took a some of it. Now, what is an axiom? An axiom, basically, it comes from a Greek word that means honor, but an axiom is a truism. It's a self-evident truth, okay, is what that axiom really means. But he's written these 10 axioms, and I just took some of them. So I want to show you these here, because I think these, if you really understand these, it really makes the gospel very clear. But the assurance of salvation is based up in the facts of the gospel itself, the assurance. If you understand the gospel, you don't have any problem with eternal security. Because if all your sins were paid for, how many sins do you have to pay for, right? If you understand that. So, um, the gospel message basically boils down to this. And here's the first one that I'm going to put up here. It's a person can have eternal right relationship with God based solely upon the merits of Christ, sacrificial death on the cross for their sins. You can have a right relationship with God. It was all by Christ. And you think, well, what do I have to do? I have to, I have to do this, do that. No, it's all based on the sacrificial death of Christ on the cross. So a right relationship with God based solely on the merits of what Christ did on the cross for you. And that, that is good to understand, but that's hard to get through some people's heads. As a kid growing up, I knew I was going to heaven because I was a pretty good kid. I looked at the kids that were bad, and I thought I was better than them. So I, and I went to church sometimes. I thought I was going to heaven. 
boy, I would have, I would have, I would have gone to hell if I didn't find out truly that it wasn't by grace. But that's the way most people think. They think I'm pretty good. I'm better than a hypocrite neighbor that goes to church and, and so on and so on. But the truth is, none of us are going to heaven. And I'm thankful that this second lieutenant. I went to a Bible study in the army and he explained it and I understood it and I started researching and I started reading the Bible and so on and so on. I, I come to grasp it and understand it. That's all by grace through faith and, and, and it made sense. And then I went back and I started preaching to my mom and dad. <laughs> they didn't appreciate that. But my mom did eventually get saved. My dad, I don't know, he liked to argue. I, I'm not sure. I'm not positive if he did, is or isn't. I, I don't know. But anyways... The assurance of salvation is not based upon something which is occurring on the inside of you. Some people think, I don't feel like I'm saved. I must not be saved. Rather, it is based upon something that happened totally apart from you 2,000 years ago. When the Lord Jesus offered himself on your behalf as a substitutionary offering for your sins. That's something for us always to remember. Basically, don't depend on your feelings to determine if you're saved or not. Because there will be times where I feel like, Lord, I'm a long ways from you. But you know what? He still died on the cross people for my sins, and I've trusted him, and I did it one time, and that's all I need to do. My relationship as far as fellowship with him may be fractured at the time. That has nothing to do with my eternal security. Okay, so there's a, here's another um, axiom. A person looking inward for the insurance that he is saved has just lost faith in the true basis of a relationship with God. Christ's sacrifice for their sins on the cross. So if you're looking inward for your insurance, you're basically putting your faith in you and not your faith in Christ. Once you put your faith in Christ and you realize that he died on the cross for your sins and that settled it, nothing else to it, you don't have to worry about, you know, if I, am I saved because of how I feel or because of this or that. You're saved only because of Christ when he died on the cross, paid for your sins, past, present, future. Now, as far as your walk with God, that's a different story. You know, your fellowship with him. But here... It's faith in the true basis of a relationship with God. Christ sacrificed for their sins on the cross. He died. He paid it all. So don't look in inwardly for yourself to say, I don't know if I'm saved or not. Because then you're looking at yourself, and it wasn't you that hung on the cross, was it? Okay, so another truism. God the Father sent God the Son into this world in order to settle the sin debt for each and every person. Jesus finished that work on the cross. God the Father is now satisfied with the work for you. That word satisfied is, we get a big word called propitiation. He was satisfied for that sin payment. When God punished his son on the cross for your sins, that satisfied him for you. And you think about that, would you ever do that with your son? You know, that, that, to think that he did that for each and every one of us. He settled the sin problem for each and every person. That Jesus took our payment in himself for you and I. And, you know, maybe not some people don't have such terrible sins as others, but, you know, you think of the whole sins of all eternity throughout this world placed on Christ, that's pretty bad, isn't it? You think about it. Not much less you and I, our sins, right? So, another one here is if you're having doubts, it's because you're looking inward for evidence that you have believed. Why? Because you're trying to trust in your faith. In other words, I'm not sure I have enough faith. I didn't have enough faith. You know what? It's the object of your faith. What did you trust? When you came to church here, you got in your car. What did you trust? Your car to get you here. It's Christ is the object of your faith. You place your faith in him. He's the one that you trusted in. He is faithful. If you trust in him, he will save you. He, that's what the Bible says. As clear as day in John 3, 16, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. So it's not your, I have to have a certain amount of faith, or I'm not sure I had enough faith. No, it's who did you trust in? And that was Jesus Christ. So then I think this here is the last one. But the person doubting his salvation to, needs to reinvestigate the cross because the cross is the place where the sinner's peace with God was accomplished. Go back and think about it. What did Jesus do for me on the cross? It has nothing to do with us. It has nothing to do with what I did. It has all to do with what he did, right? And go back and always think about that. And, it, and you think, you know what, Lord? Thank you so much for what you did on the cross for me, that you died for me and you offered me salvation freely. It, it's a gift. So... That's the truism I looked at. The next one I'm going to look at here, this is a little bit funny if it wasn't so sad, but this is our prophecy update. Okay, I'm not sure what SLAY stands for, but World Economic Forum banker, uh, what's his name, calls for restrictions on public coffee drinking to fight climate change. <coughs> now he's gone too far. Yep. You take my coffee away, them are fighting words. 
<laughs> but a globalist World Economic Forum banker has called for restrictions on the public's consumption of coffee in order to meet green agenda targets. Now, sometimes don't you just hit yourself on the head and say, how much stupider can we get? <laughs> a video has emerged from the WEF's recent annual summit in Davos, Switzerland, that shows Swiss banker Hubert Cal Calorie, maybe <laughs> last name though, discussing how coffee production allegedly contributes to the so-called climate change. Now, they're getting carried away. Why do we not, you know, should we take care of our world? Of course we should. We shouldn't abuse it. But who really keeps, has control of this whole world? God does, right? So if anybody talks climate change with you, always go to Genesis chapter 8, verse 22. Genesis 8, 22 says, While the earth remains, seed time, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. You know what's interesting about that verse? You know when it, that verse was, what was that right after? Right after the ark landed, right? Right after the ark landed, Noah's ark. And so let me go ahead and look at uh, Genesis 8, the two verses before that. It says, And Noah built an ark an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and every clean fall and offered burnt offerings on the altar. So God loves burnt offerings, okay? So in heaven we're going to be eating, you know, steak and chicken and all that stuff. <laughs> and then verse 21 of chapter 8 says, And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, The Lord said in his heart, God has a heart? Actually that's, you know, just so you and I can understand it, right? But his innermost being, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Isn't it though? Man's heart's evil from his youth. Um, Neither will I again smite any more everything as I have done. So the ark landed, and then verse 22, while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. God's got it all under control. You know, so the people with the global warming, I mean, they're, what they're really trying to do is have a threat that they can, they can attach onto so they can take control of everybody, really. You know, let's get all together and bind, have a common foe that we all fight against. That's their whole point of doing that. So, okay, that's uh, Genesis 8:22 for the prophetic update. Next, I'm going to do apologetic. And as you know, I've been going through these short little um, two-minute videos that Bruce Malone produces. He's... He's got his ministry up in Michigan. It would be kind of cool to have him come down here someday and, and speak. But I'm going to give you a little bit of a promotional on his website. Then next week I'll start off with more of these, these, uh, promo, uh, more of these uh, apologetic videos that he has. But this is going to be a little promotion on what his website says. So if you ever want to go to his website, you can. And his website is Search for Truth, Bruce, Bruce, Bruce Malone, searchforthetruth.net. You can find that on the Internet. But he's got... He's got tons of stuff in there in apologetics. And this guy makes it so that somebody like me can understand it. So let's watch his uh, two-minute video here, and then we'll get on today's message. Welcome to Creation Central, uh, where you found our website with incredible resources for studying and understanding creation. Uh, let me give you a little two-minute introduction to what all you can find here. Um, the first tab you'll see here on the home page is called the Without a Doubt series, and it's 60 or more little two and three minute videos filmed on location with lots of animation, all showing the amazing features and creatures of different parts of God's creation. Kind of a daily reminder, just a real quick snippet of the reality that God is behind all these marvels of creation. Further down from that, you'll find kind of the meat of our ministry. And that is an 18 part series called The Rocks Cry Out. Each of these videos are about 45 minutes long. There's a tab where you can go to our YouTube page and actually watch some of these videos in a lower resolution form or a tab where you can go and purchase them via a flash drive, which has a Blu-ray quality, high resolution version of all these. Now, each of these films took about two months and $10,000 to produce. They're filled with animation, drone footage, filmed on location around the country that covers all of the evidence and the information from genetics and geology and biology and astronomy and anthropology um, for the trustworthiness of God's word and what it has to say about where we came from shows you why the mechanisms and the things that are promoted about the Big Bang and cosmic evolution and chemical evolution and biological evolution, they can't possibly be true. They're scientifically impossible. 
Uh, so you get to see a viewpoint you're not going to get in schools and textbooks and museums and on the internet. And, and then finally, you'll follow the last tab to a set of devotionals. We've produced four different devotionals where every day of the year, beautiful, full color, hard covered, extensively illustrated books that talk about the parts of our body and anatomy and the miraculous nature of creation and stars and fossils and how it all fits together. So thank you for visiting our website and I hope it becomes a great resource for you in the future. I think it's kind of neat that he does that. It's where was he? Where's he at? Yeah, I don't, he's a, net going yeah, I don't know where that was. <laughs> Maybe had on, on a seashore somewhere, <coughs> get caught, getting caught in the net. But his ministry's up in Michigan somewhere. But um, he puts a lot into this, and it's it's fascinating to think that, you know, that you look at people that <coughs> just believe in evolution because they believe that's the intelligent belief, and yet the truth is it's the unintelligent belief. And the intelligent belief is to realize God designed everything. I mean, design, even simple stuff we know it is designed, but the complex biological things, it's pretty amazing. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into our study. Um, this is going to be Lesson 5D. I've had A, B, C, and D for five on rewards of heaven, and this is where we'll finish 5D. Then we'll get into our next ones in the next week. But we titled this The Five Crowns of Scriptures. We're gonna, that's the last five messages we're going to have. So... As far as the award rewards, the 10 prominent BEMA award rewards, we've gone through uh, number one through eight over the last three weeks. Now, the fourth week, we're going to talk about the Overcomer Award rewards. And this is kind of interesting. But our goal, obviously, as we've said before, is to receive your well done, good and faithful servant. And that just means be faithful what you're doing. Whatever skills or abilities God has given you, use it and do it. And be faithful. Don't be afraid to stand up for Christ even though other people may stand against you. But we're going to talk about the Overcomer Rewards. Next week, since we have, what we've gone through so far was, I think, eight messages so far, um, which give us a good foundation, a good basis of this. So the next three messages are going to be, the, I don't know if I'd say they're the most important, but they're going to be extremely important. So next week, we're going to talk about the details of this judgment, the Bema Seat judgment. The week after that, we're going to talk about how to invest in your future. What do you and I do? to make this reward thing a possibility. And then the next one after that is going to be pain of regret and loss of reward. This is the one that is going to be like the negative side of the coin that day, which is going to be a lot of people in heaven are going to have tears of regret because they didn't do anything for Christ. And then we'll go into the five crowns individually, okay, after that. So we'll be getting through this here in the next uh, two months. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at the overcomer um, rewards. And the first thing is I want to have probably a good definition for what it means by overcome. And in the Old Testament, the word is only used six times. And it's the word yahol. It means to prevail, overcome, endure, have power, be able, be victor. Actually, the Old Testament meaning of yahol and the New Testament mean, meaning of yakao or, or nikao is the same. It's the same basic word. One's Hebrew, one's Greek. Means to subdue, fig literally or fig figuratively, conquer, overcome, prevail, get the victory. And this is, you know the company Nike, right? Shoes? That's where they get that word Nike from. It's that word right there. Nikao. Okay, it's the exact same, it's the Greek word in the English word that is Nike. It means conquer, it means to overcome, prevail, get the victory. So I'm going to look at a couple Old Testament verses, then we'll look at some New Testament verses, and then you know where this is talked about a lot, right? Revelation chapter 2 and 3. So we're going to look at them seven churches and get a little understanding more of that, which you can only understand so much. It's like God give you a little bit to wet your taste of this, but he doesn't give you all the details. But it kind of gets you excited that, you know, there, there are rewards that he's going to give us if we're faithful to him. And so Numbers 13, verse 30. Remember Joshua and Caleb, right? Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession, for we are all well able to overcome it. Why would Caleb say it when he was that small and these guys were giants in the land? Well, because he knew that God was with them, right? Joshua and Caleb wanted to go take them. They believed they could overcome them. The word there, Yahol. That they, but, but the rest of the people didn't want to, right? So they had to wander around in the wilderness for 40 years after that because they did not have the faith of Joshua and Caleb. Actually, our second son, we were going to name him Caleb. 
and we changed our mind at the last minute. We named him Jason. Jason's a good name, right? <laughs> so, that's before we knew this Jason here. No, we still named him that. It's a, it's a very, but we stuck with the J's, Joshua, Jason, and Justin. Okay, anyways, so Caleb had the courage, and he wanted to go there and take the land, but none of them wanted to go with him, just Joshua. And so that word overcome it, he believes they could overcome it, they could prevail, they could have victory. So let's look at one more Old Testament verse, and that's Jeremiah 23, verse 9. Now, Jeremiah was the weeping prophet. And it says, Jeremiah says, My heart within me is broken because of the prophets. All my bones shake. I'm like a drunken man and like a man whom wine has overcome because of the Lord and because of his holy words. So he was, he was heartbroken. He was overcome. It's like he's saying like he drank too much in a sense that it overcome. He, 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 he couldn't stand up. He was like a drunken man. But he was overcome. It's what he's saying. Like a man who was overcome by wine. Okay? So... The word he was that prevailed upon him. It had victory over him, basically, right? And you, uh, you, all oh, I'm sure seen people that were pretty wasted, and they're out of their mind, and they're just, they're just in a whole different world, right? And that's what Jeremiah is saying. He, you know, he was so brokenhearted because of what was going on in Israel, and that all the prophets were not, they weren't good prophets; they were bad prophets. So the word overcome is used there. So let's look at a New Testament word. Um, Luke chapter 11 verse 22 but when a stranger but when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him he takes from him all his armor wherein he trusted and divides his spoils so being overcome somebody stronger came in and overcame you it, it was you know over you know basically caused you to submit to him and says he overcame and he took all your spoils everything you had so that's what the word overcome means. It means to be stronger than something else. So Romans 12, 21, this is where it's used twice. It says, do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, that's an interesting verse, isn't it, right? When you, somebody does something evil to you, what do you want to do back to them? You want to, you want to re, respond back to them in the same way, right? But the Bible says don't do that. Now, that's not saying we, we need to put ourselves out there to be abused, does it? No, you should not put yourself in an abusive situation. But if somebody does something bad to you, you overcome evil with good. And so here in verse, let me look at this here in, in Romans chapter 12, verse 20, it tells us this, the verse right before that. Where am I here? Okay, 1220. It says, Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. So the idea is, you know, they make the person feel bad for the way he was. But you overcome evil with good. So that's what the word overcome here means in that verse there. So let's go to 1 John chapter 5. I'm going to look at verses 4 and 5 here in just a second. But when the Apostle John wrote the Gospel of John, he wrote it sometime in the late 80s. Okay, remember? The Apostle John was the young, youngest of all the apostles, right? So sometime in the late 80s, he wrote the Gospel of John. And why did he write it? That you might believe. So John chapter 20, verse 31. Let me read that to you. Right at the end of his book in John chapter 20, verse 31, he says this. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. So the whole purpose for the gospel of his John was for you to believe. That's why when you have somebody new or somebody looking into Christianity, you'll tell them, read the gospel of John, right? And so it was written so that you would believe. That's why the apostle John wrote the book of John, so that you might believe. Now here in 1 John, which is written a few years later, probably on 90 AD, 12 times he uses the 1 John, refers to the word children. In other words, he's talking about young Christians, children. And he's talking about fellowship. So 1 John chapter 1, and I'm going to look at verse 3 and 4 of chapter 1 of 1 John. It says, That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. So 1 John was written for a whole different purpose, really. It was written that you might have fellowship. It was written to people that were already Christians. It was written about how to have fellowship, how to, how to grow, how to be mature, 
And so it's basically written as a book about, hey, you as a Christian, these are things you need to know. And he refers to the word children in there 12 times in that book. So in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 and 5 on the screen, it says, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Basically he's saying, you can overcome if you walk by faith. And sometimes we don't walk by faith, we walk by fear, don't we? We walk by what we think that we, the world taught us how we should be. But John says we should walk by faith, and that's how you overcome. Then it goes on to say, who is he that overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Okay, so first of all, sin's overcome by trusting Christ as Savior, right? Because Christ paid for you all your sins. Now you're a child of God. Now we must... Um, we must, by our faith, must walk by faith. So now we must walk for Christ as you know you're a child of him. And that's why in First John it uses children 12 times because he's talking to young children. And even though it's kind of funny, interestingly, because at one time um, he was the youngest one, right? But here he's telling these people there that, hey, this is how you're going to grow up as a Christian. So here's what's kind of interesting. The Apostle John, in the New Testament, as I mentioned before, I think the Old Testament used it six times, the New Testament uh, 25 times, 18 times is used by the Apostle John. 72% of the time when that word overcome is used, it's used by John. Um, twice in his gospel, five times in 1 John, in the book of Revelation, he uses it 11 times where he uses that word overcome, how to be an overcomer, okay? So 72% of the time that it's used in the New Testament, it's used by the Apostle John. Now, if you look at the other uses, I think Matthew maybe used it once, Luke maybe used it once or twice, Paul used it, Peter used it, and so on. So everybody else used it once or twice only for the other seven times of the 18, of the 25 times. But God's final letter, letter to the church is the book of Revelation, extremely important. He left us that book because, so we can understand what's going to happen in the future. So if you want to look to Revelation chapter 2, and we'll look at these. We're not going to go in depth on these. We covered these uh, when we went through the book of Revelation. But I want to look at these verses that talk about the overcomer. So you know these seven churches. The first church is Ephesus. We'll talk about here in just a second. But it's God's final letter to the churches. It talks about these overcomer rewards. And as I said, we don't know all the details of these rewards. He just says you're going to have this reward as an overcomer. You have this reward. And you have to think, okay, what does that mean? It gives you something to think about, right? Something to dream about at night, you know. What could that reward possibly be? He gives you some idea, but as far as all the details of it, I'm not sure we'll know until we get to heaven. Maybe we couldn't really understand it. I don't know. But look at Revelation chapter 2 in verse 7. It says this. And this is to the church of Ephesus. He says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, will I give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So first of all, I think an overcomer is when you trust Christ as Savior, your sin's been overcome because of what Christ did on the cross for you. So you are an overcomer. But the next stage to be an overcomer is how you overcome in your Christian life and your walk, okay? And I think that's what it's talking about here in Revelation. I mean, we're all overcomers in the sense that, hey, Christ overcame on the cross your sin debt. But now as far as you live, if you want to become an overcomer, in your life as far as your maturity in Christ, it's talking about here in these seven churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. And all these churches had some problems, didn't they? Except for two of them, really, Smyrna and, and Philadelphia. They were all told, you know, hey, you need to improve. This is what you're doing wrong, and so on. So do we see this in churches today? Well, definitely we do. Now, we see some Philadelphia churches. We see mostly today Laodicean churches, and I think if you look at throughout history, you can take these churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, all the way down, these seven church ages, and you can look at them as being church ages throughout history. Now, it, at the time when it was written, I, think, I don't think you can necessarily interpret that, but now that we look back at it, we see that, hey, this looks like the way it is, truthfully. And I truly do believe that we are in what's called the Laodicean church age, which is the lukewarm church age, the church of people's rights, is what that really means. Okay, so that was verse 7. He says, if you overcome, I'll give to you to the tree of life, which is in the middle of the paradise of God. I remember they, they got kicked out of the paradise of God back in Genesis. And so, but in heaven, you're going to be able to be back in it. Then back up in uh, verse 4, it says there, 
Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, against Ephesus, because thou hast left thy first love. And so they left their first love. So you remember when you first got saved and how excited you were? And later on, you, maybe you, you kind of don't, not so excited and you kind of lose your first love. That's kind of what he's talking about here is about the Ephesian believers. They, they, they were in love, but they left their first love. So that's why Jesus is rebuking them here. And he says, um, if you overcome, you can eat from the tree of life. And that's special access to that tree. What is that actually going to mean? That's something we all could discuss, right? But, you know, it, it's, it's something that God says he offers you. If you overcome, you have your special access to this tree of life. And there's different ideas on that, okay? Um, they believe that you could eat of this tree and it would, it would basically restore you or whatever. I don't know for sure. But that was Ephesus. Now, Smyrna, in Revelation 2, verse 11, it says, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He that overcomes should not be hurt by the second death. Now, if you look at there in verse 11, you wonder, what does that mean, not be hurt by the second death? You know this was written to churches. You know this was written to Christians. So Christians are not going to suffer the second death. Uh, second death is talked about uh, chapter 21 and 22, I think, three different times. Second death is being cast into the lake of fire. I mean, obviously, if you know Christ, Christ the Savior, you will not be cast in the lake of fire. So what does that mean by not be hurt by the second death? Well, I don't know for sure. But this is what Joe Wall says. He's the one that the book, one of the books I'm studying called Going for Gold. He says that you'll be protected from the ill effects of the great white throne judgment. And have you ever heard the idea that you and I are going to actually see people cast into the lake of fire at the great white, white throne judgment? I don't want to see that. I don't want to see that. That's going to be brokenhearted if you see somebody you know that you love, and especially somebody that you've shared the gospel with or given a tract to or or that maybe even came to your church or family member, you don't want to see that. And so Joe Wall says maybe that is what that means, protected from the ill effects of the second death. I don't know that for sure. But I do know this. If you look back in verse 10, we see here, it says in Revelation 2.10, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, let me get caught up here. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, and you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. And be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give thee a crown of life. So being faithful, we get the crown of life, and we're going to talk about that crown later on. But the way I look at this with Smyrna, there's kind of a contrast here, okay? I mean, persecuted, thrown in um, jail, suffering. But the thing that you always can look forward to is you will not suffer the second death. The truth is we won't. You know, they can beat the tar out of you, do whatever they want to you, they can kill you. But you're not going to suffer the second death. You die, you're going to spend eternity in heaven. So I, that's the way I kind of see it. Now, Joe Wall sees it as you won't, be, you won't see the ill effects of the great white throne judgment. That kind of makes a little bit of sense too. But nevertheless, it's a reward that we're going to earn. And as, a, as you see in verse 10, the crown of life, which we're going to talk about later. So, okay. So that if you're an overcomer, it's, it's going to end up being something good. The crown of life, not suffer the second death, whatever, however you look at that. So the third one here is with the church of Pergamos. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 17, it tells us in verse 17, talking about the church of Pergamos, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcome, will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, save in he that received it except he that received it. Now that verse, I always, I sat there and think about it, think, what does that mean? What is this white stone? And it, it's, it's kind of difficult to understand this, but there's different ideas on that too. But nevertheless, it says, the hidden manna, the white stone, a new name, the provisions provided with that as a reward, we will understand and see when we get to heaven. But you're promised that. So I think the problem here in Pergamos is one of their main problems is a false doctrine. So you look at verse 14 and 15 of chapter 2, says, but I have a few things against you, because you have there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idol, so the idol worship, and to commit fornication, and also fornication. So has thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. So God hates false doctrine, okay? Straighten your act up together and make sure you have correct doctrine. Churches should have correct doctrine. The problem today is churches don't have any doctrine, 
So you, no matter who you are, you come into a church and you can believe anything you want because there's nothing talked about doctrine. The only thing that's talked about is how to live your life and how you can be better at what you're doing and, and get along with your neighbor and so on. But here, you see here that this one here, it talks about the provisions provided with this hidden manna, this white stone, this new name. So that's a reward spoken of here for the church of Pergamos as they um, overcome and mainly overcome false doctrine and fornication and so on. So let's go ahead and look at Thyatira. And this is in the end of Revelation, chapter 2, verse 26. It tells us, chapter 2, verse 26, talking about the church of Thyatira. It says, He that overcometh and keepeth my words unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Okay, this one I understand a little better. It's talking about ruling and reigning with Christ, I think. You're given a position of, of leadership in the kingdom. In verse 20, it says there, uh, one of their problems here in this church of Thyatira, verse 20, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because you suffer that woman Jezebel, which called herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servant to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now they believe her name wasn't really Jezebel, but they were using that and they were calling her. But all this stuff about Jezebel, about false teachers being allowed in the church, you see there there's idols, you see that all this stuff, um, uh, fornication, there's a carnality, and so you overcome that in your church, what's talking about here the church of Theratera, and I will give you power over the nations. So he promised you that reward. So we need to be overcomers of all these different things. And we need to make sure our churches are, are um, pure, true doctrine. We don't allow false teachers. All that stuff. And that's not easy sometimes, is it? So, But that's, that's the idea here. Thyatira needed to clean up their act. So then Sardis. Now Sardis, as you know, is the dead church. Starting off in Revelation chapter 3. Verse 5, it tells us in Revelation 3, 5, He that overcomes, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. So that's like God, Jesus taking you up and say, Father, this is my faithful servant here. But it talks about white garments, not take uh, your name out of the book of life, he'll confess you before God. So outwardly, your clothing and so on, is the reward that you'll get. And in verse 1, as you see here in Revelation chapter 3, what was wrong with this church was, And unto the angel of the church of Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God, seven stars. I know that works, that thou hast a name, and thou livest, and art dead. Basically, that church was a dead church. Have you ever been into a dead church? I mean, you go you know, a church, and it's like, I remember Wilman tell, tell me once that she went to this church here in Lafayette, and... Not one person said hi to her. She sat there, and this was a church with, well, uh, quite a few people, and nobody talked to her at all. And basically, they went through the motions, I'll get up and go home. And that's kind of the way it was at church as a kid for me, too. I mean, the only people that would ever talk to you would be maybe your relatives. It was basically, you go through there, you just go through the church service, you get up and you go home. It's like you filled the next in the box, right? But churches are dead, and they can be dead. That's, Sardis was a dead church. And it was polluted by the world. I think this was a church the entertainment. There wasn't no Christianity anymore. And so he says that you overcome this and you will have all these things that he offers you and he will confess you before God the Father. Okay, so that's another one of the overcomer rewards. Another one is in Philadelphia. Now Philadelphia was like Smyrna, one of the good churches. And today we want to be a church of Philadelphia. Yes, we want to be a church of Smyrna also, but it, I, I don't prefer the... Uh, martyrdom part okay <laughs> but anyways church of philadelphia um chapter 3 verse 12 it says here him that overcomes will i make a pillar in the temple of my god and he shall go no more out and i will write upon him the name of my god and the name of the city of my god which is new jerusalem which cometh down out of heaven from my god and i'll write upon him my new name so you know the philadelphia church it says here that you will be a pillar and you have a new name. It's like you'll be in a special category. God has something special for you. But it says here in verse 8 and 10 of chapter 3. Where am I at here? Verse 8. It says, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength. Now that's a positive comment, having a little strength. I mean... 
Today, little churches like ours, we have a little strength. And don't look down on that. We have a little strength. But with God, we have a lot of strength, okay? And has kept my word and has not denied my name. Then verse 9. Behold, I'll make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I'll make them to come and worship before thee and to know that I have loved thee. So God loves a Philadelphian church that stands for, strong for him. They keep his word. They keep his name. He'll make you a pillar. He'll make you a new name. So this is the overcomer reward there for Philadelphia. And then we get to the Laodicean church. Re Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. It's the, to him that overcomes... Why grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. So that there is the Laodicean church. Now you think of the Laodicean church, remember he knocked on the door and he wanted to have fellowship with them? That's not talking about salvation, it's talking about Christ wanted to have part of that church and they basically closed the door on him and they have their own entertainment and they do their own thing. And so here it says that because that church, it says, if you overcome, you can sit down with me on my throne. His inner circle. I think this is a cool reward when you think about it. Remember back in the Mount, Mount of Transfiguration, which I believe is Mount Hermon, because it was a very tall mountain in, in there in Israel, and that Peter, James, and John went with Jesus up to the Mount of Transfiguration, and they were the close inner circle of him. So I think what we're seeing here is, he says in verse 21, you'll sit with me on my throne. I think that in the kingdom, there will be those that will be closer to Christ than others. Others because they haven't done nothing for Christ, will not have that close um, fellowship with God. In fact, in verse 15 and 16 of chapter 3, it says, speaking of this Laodicean church, it says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou art cold nor hot. In other words, they were lukewarm, right? Then in verse 16, So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. So, Jesus does not like lukewarm Christianity. Lukewarm Christianity, nobody even knows you're a Christian. But he wants us to be hot or cold, like the, we talked about the water coming into that uh, Laodicean area. But the inner circle here, sit down on my throne. So this is looking at Revelation 2 and 3, them seven churches. And I know that there's a not a lot of details about these rewards. And you, we, can't, we can go through and we can think about these, but as far as understanding it, he will reward overcomers that overcome these bad things that happen in these churches. Now there's one more time here in Revelation that that word is used, overcoming. It's Revelation 21, verse 7. This is at the end of the book. It says, He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. I think heaven has so much for you for to offer and that we need to live for eternity because it's going to be absolutely marvelous. I think it's 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9 maybe, I can't remember, but Paul said that we can't even fathom what God has for us in heaven. We can't even imagine it. But anyways, we'll inherit all things. So I think we all have an inheritance in heaven because you're a child of God. But you know what? The more you serve him, the more you live home for him, the more you're an overcomer, then I think you're going to have more and more yet because he's going to bless you with that in heaven. So... And it says there, he who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God. He shall be my son. Now, I want to show you something that's pretty cool. Back in Revelation chapter 5, verse 5. I'm going to flip back there to Revelation 5, 5. Because that word there, which is uh, nikao, in Revelation 5, 5, you'll see here, it says, in verse 5 of Revelation chapter 5, it says, And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now that was Jesus, right? Lion of the tribe of Judah. And then it says, The root of David has prevailed to open the book and to loose its seven seals thereof. In other words, he was worthy to do that. The lion of the tribe of Judah. That word prevailed, that word prevailed could have been translated as overcome. It's the exact same word. It's the same there of uh, nikao, and it means overcome, but it was translated there as prevailed. So Jesus overcome, Jesus prevailed, and he died, went to the cross for your sins. He conquered death for you and I. So I thought that was kind of neat when I saw that there. But one more time, if you look at this, in the Old Testament, the word means the same as the New Testament. It's the word Yahoo in the Old Testament. The New Testament is Nikao, and it talks about being victorious. We can live victorious Christian lives. And that's what God wants us to do. It's basically submitting to God's word, submitting to the Holy Spirit working in your life, uh, staying away from bad places you shouldn't be in, uh, making sure that you're always staying close to God 
and not being influenced by bad influences. And that's something that we have to always be thinking about every day. I want to be a conqueror. I want to be somebody that's going to overcome. So how do we live as an overcomer? Well, I think the best place to look at is Ephesians chapter 6. And I'll be done here in just a minute. But Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 18. Let's look at this briefly. But notice what Paul says in verse 10. He says, finally. So he said all this stuff. Then he says, finally. This is what I want you to understand, brethren. You know, fellow Christians. Be strong. That word strong there is in, in dinamo. It's where we get our word dynamite from. Another word that means dynamite. Another word, be dynamite. Be strong. Um, and it's talking about you have to make an active mental decision to do this. He's saying be strong. It doesn't happen automatically. You and I have to make the decision to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Then verse 11, put, put on the whole armor of God. Now here's the thing. This armor, you don't really put on a helmet or a breastplate or these shoes, do you? It's a metaphor. It means something, right? So let's talk about a little bit about what it means for Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wilds of the devil. And the wilds of the devil don't quit. They're getting worse and worse today. Verse 12, For you wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Always realize that our battle is a spiritual battle. It may manifest itself in some other person or in something that's happened in your life, things going on, but it's a spiritual battle that we're fighting right now in this world today. So always be ready for that. And it's against spiritual wickedness in high places. Behind the scenes, there's a spiritual battle going on, and it's out to ruin your life as a Christian. Prevent you from witnessing, prevent other people from being saved. Always making people think, I've got to do something to be saved, I've got to be good, I've got to have good works. But then in verse 13, it says, Wherefore, take unto you. He says, take unto you. You have to make that decision. The whole armor of God. That's a metaphor, obviously that you may be able to stand in the evil day and have done all to stand. Do everything you can to overcome, to stand. Verse 14, stand therefore, having your loins girded about with truth. What does that mean, loins girded about with truth? It means know your Bible, understand doctrine, understand what it says, so that you can have discernment in this day and age. And having put on the breastplate of righteousness, live a righteous life. Do what you do that you know is right according to what the Bible says. Then in verse 15, And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The only way we have peace is through the gospel. I think Romans 5.1 says that. But share the good news. Remember your testimony. Your testimony matters. People are looking at you, okay? You know, something. sometimes we have to always remember that people, if they know you're a Christian and they're watching you and they see that you don't act like a Christian, it gives them an excuse to say, well, look at that Christian, right? And so we have to watch our testimony, plus we have to be willing to share the good news. Then in verse 16, Above all, take on the shield of faith, which means live and walk by faith. Don't walk by fear. Don't be afraid. Wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Because you're going to be attacked. There's going to be things thrown at you. Verse 17. Take the helmet of salvation. Protect yourself. Avoid evil temptations. I mean, Satan's going to try to get things in your head. So the idea is protect yourself. The helmet of salvation. Have confidence that, hey, I'm saved, I'm God's child, His Holy Spirit lives within me. Then it says, and the sword of the Spirit, that's a weapon. Um, read your Bible, listen to good Bible teaching, go to church, quote the Bible, know the Bible. That's your defense, it's your offensive weapon, really, okay, which is the Word of God. Then verse 18, pray and always. Make prayer a habit. Try to have a time where you, do, you pray all the, when you can, like certain times of the day. With all prayer and supplication, prayer, talk to God, supplication, asking God for things. There's nothing wrong with asking God for anything. Just make sure that you're praising Him and worshiping Him also, in that the Spirit and watching, be attentive to what's going on there unto with all perseverance, persistent, be persistent. Supplication, ask prayer for each other too, others too. Supplication for all saints. We should pray for each other. So, to summarize thee, I put seek truth, be righteous. Share the gospel, walk by faith, be secure in your salvation, read your Bible, and pray always. And it's interesting, there's seven of these, the complete list of seven. So that's something that we need to always be thinking about. And 
Ephesians 6, 10 through 18 is a, is a pretty good set of scriptures. And someday we'd like to go through this um, step by step in detail. But, you know, put on that armor of God and make sure that every day you're protecting yourself. So don't be overcome. Don't drift back. I, it, back in Hebrews, it talks about those drifting back. And if you want to look at this verse, we won't right now, but Hebrews chapter 3, verse uh, 12 through 13 talks about that, how people, Paul warns them, don't go back into the way you were. Stand strong. Things may get hard, things may get rough, but always be an overcomer. So we can be overcomers, and being an overcomer is someone that is going to receive additional rewards from God. Okay, uh, Revelation 22:12 it says when he comes back, he brings his rewards with him. 